things are different when you turn 40, you know. It's, it's a little different. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. You guys ready? It says like this. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus had sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragment, fra fragrant oil, verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. As she began to wash his feet with her tears, he wiped She wiped them with the hair on her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of this The, the woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner. Verse 40, and Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One old 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair on her head. You gave me no kiss. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the word of the Lord. I want to talk to you from the subject one moment. The power of one moment. Now, Before we go in and dissect a few of these words in Scripture that we just read, I, I do want to make notice that the book of Mark, chapter 14 and verse 3, is the parallel of this same story with important insight which I think behooves us to consider the diverse angles with which both writers tell this same story of redemption and the grace of God towards this woman and that embraced one opportunity that forever changed the story of her life. So chapter 14 of the book of Mark is the same story that we read in the book of Luke chapter 7. So what I'm going to do during this, this message is I'm going to go a little bit back and forth because I think it's important that we get different angles of the same story. You know, every time somebody tells a story, you ever played the, the, you ever played the game telephone? You ever played the game telephone? Where you line up a few people and one person says something and they repeat it to the next person as best they can and repeat it to the next person as best they can. After about 20 people, the story has absolutely changed and there's different angles to what the first person said. Well, I think it's important that 
uh, the, the authors write different angles of the same story. And so it's important that we read the parallels of this so that we can embrace completely what really happened in this moment for this lady's life that forever changed her. So we'll be going back for, by, from Mark 14 and Luke chapter 7. And the opportunity that she had to be with Jesus, this story, number one, this story, first of all, this story takes place in a city called Bethany. This story, Mark tells us that this story takes place in a city called Bethany. Bethany, the name Bethany is translated by some to mean the house of figs. As there are many fig trees and palms in the area. But the real more true translation to the word Bethany, it translates to the house of misery. Mm -hmm. Speculating that Bethany was a designated place for the sick and those with contagious diseases. What, what astounds me about this is that Jesus was not ignorant of the condition of Bethany. Jesus was not um, ignorant to the fact of the people that lived in Bethany. As a matter of fact, Jesus purposely would visit Bethany because there was something about broken people and there was something about sick people that Jesus understood his task and his mission on earth that he didn't come for the righteous, that he came for those who were lost, for those who, who were away from God, those who had no relationship with community. So Jesus is so strategic and intentional about making sure he brings his presence to spaces and places where everybody else is rejected, yet Jesus comes to a city called Bethany where there's many diseased and sick people and now he finds himself not in the city but in a house in a house of a mo in a moment where there's a where there's sinners and there's people that need the presence of God I don't know if if this says anything to you but I'm so grateful for a Jesus that is not afraid of my sinful diseases I'm, I'm so grateful for a Jesus that is intentional not to shy away from the areas that I many times are ashamed of, but he runs to the areas of my life and is intentional about being in places and spaces that you might think God is not because I know what you were thought. You were taught that, that in order to come to God, you have to be good. That in order to come to God, you got to have your life together. That in order to come to church, you gotta, you, you got to dot all your I's and cross all your T's and, and make sure that your heart is right before you walk into a sanctuary. But can I, can I tell you that the Jesus that I serve, he actually is not waiting for you to have it all together. He's actually waiting for you to come to him so that he can help you get it all together. Is there anybody here that knows what I'm talking about? You didn't have it together when you came to Jesus, but he was so approachable that he came to your Bethany. He came to your Bethany. And then the Bible teaches us that while he's in Bethany, he is in this situation now where he is sitting with religious men and men and Pharisees and scribes and, you know, all the high class of the church. And, and so a sinful woman walks in and from the backside comes and begins to anoint his whole body. This is a sinful woman who saw a moment of opportunity and approached him from behind and filled with shame and fear but yet faith I know this is one this is, what do you mean is it shame is it fear or is it faith can I tell you that sometimes it's a little bit of both sometimes we don't have the full faith sometimes we are in shame but there's something about Jesus that draws us to him even in our shame with a little bit of faith and maybe that's how you came today. I, I don't really believe this whole Christian thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, he might do it. He might not. That's okay. Just get to Jesus. 
get to Jesus, get, get to the place where everything can change. And so she comes from behind and, and the Bible in the book of Mark says that she anointed his head. But Luke says that she anointed his feet. And I was kind of left wondering, oh, well, did she anoint the head or she anoint the feet? But then it reminded me of the book of Psalms chapter 133 and verse 2 when it says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil that comes over the head of Aaron and it starts at the head and begins to run down his beard and it goes all the way down to the robe and reaches down to his feet. The truth is this, that this woman created a mess in Simon's house. You've ever had people over... And, um, you know, it took a minute to clean, but then you got to do the second clean. I'm going to talk to this side. I'm going to talk to this side because some of you, you ain't going to say nothing. But, you know, when people come over and you got the first cleanup and then you got to do the second cleanup, you know, this woman made a mess. And I'm going to tell you why, because the Bible clearly tells you, tells us that she began to pour the oil on his head, but it was such a mess that it ran all the way to his feet. So you can imagine this was not a little, a, a little, a little, just a little jar of oil. I mean, this was the jar of oil. And have you ever had oil on your shirt or on your garments? I mean, it like it's ruined. This woman creates a mess at Simon's house. But her need was greater than the opinion of others. Can I tell you that desperation has a moment of understanding? I don't care what you think about me. My need for Jesus is greater than my need for your approval, affirmation. I don't care what you think about me coming to church every Sunday. It doesn't matter what you think about me tithing or giving my offering or clapping my hands or shouting unto God with a voice of triumph. My, you, you, my need is greater for Jesus than it is your opinion about whatever you think because what I'm going through needs a miracle. What I'm going, what my family is going through needs an intervention from God. So if I look a little crazy, Shouting from the top of my lungs, excuse me for a moment, but I need to get the G. Is there anybody desperate enough to say, I don't care what you think about me on this Sunday morning. I've got something that Jesus has. I need Jesus today. So number one, you need to know, uh, when a, when a, one of the things that I live by is, is a saying by Leonard Ravenhill that said this, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized at the lifetime of the opportunity. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized at the lifetime of the opportunity. Can I speak to somebody today who is who is, who is in, in, in doubt about should I, should I not? And this goes for every area of your life. Should I do it? Should I not? Should I step out by faith and take my, faith, my next step of faith? Should I, should, I, should, I, should I go full into God or should I not? Should I, should I start the business? Should I not start the business? Should I make the phone call? Should I not make the phone call? Should, should, I, should, I, should I market a little more? Should I not market it? I don't know, but all I know is that the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized at the lifetime of the opportunity. Every opportunity has a lifetime. Every opportunity, every moment has a lifetime. And you might not get it anymore. But those who step out and understand my need for God is greater than anything else. You step out and you seize the moment. This lady, she was a sinner. She understood that there's an opportunity. Here's Jesus. And she says, I, they're going to talk about me. They're going to shame me. They're going to say negative things about me. But 
I've understood something that when preparation meets opportunity, it leads to your destiny. When preparation meets your opportunity, it accelerates you to your destiny. James chapter 4 verse 14 says like this, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? Is it even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away? You don't know about tomorrow, but you're here right now in a holy moment where God designed everything for this moment for you. This woman knew Jesus is in the house, I'm in the house, and this is no coincidence. I was prepared for the moment. How do, I, how do you know that the woman was prepared? How do you know that this sinful woman was prepared? Because she had the alabaster box ready. She wasn't waiting to see if someday Jesus will show up and then get the alabaster box with oil ready. No, she had it ready because when opportunity meets preparation, it will accelerate you to your destiny. I'm here to talk to somebody today that the opportunity of a lifetime is here right now. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and he's about to lead you to the next next thing in your somebody clap your hands like you believe you're getting ready to get propelled you're getting ready to go to the next level you're getting ready because you came prepared she was prepared with her alabaster box and she might not ever get that opportunity again and she says ah, this is it let me put let me bring the alabaster box out and and, and some of you, you know the story, but for those that don't know the story, those that do know the story, just bear with me. Be patient with me. You might get a little something out of it too. And so she comes out and she has the box. And I can just imagine how beautiful the box is. And, but here, here's the problem. Here's the problem. That the oil... While the oil is in the box, it will not serve its purpose. Listen to me. While the oil is in the box, it will not serve its purpose. I'm going to say it for the people in the balcony. The oil, while it's in the box, will not serve its purpose. So she knew, I can't just bring the, I can't just bring the box. I got to take the oil out. Here was the problem. Once the oil went in, there was no way to get this thing out except for one way. She had to break it. She had to break the oil. So how many of you believe you when you break the oil with the, and the, with the, bo the box with the oil in it, it's going to go everywhere. It's going to get messy. So Simon, he's got a, he throws a fit. This woman comes into my house. Her life is a mess. And now she made a mess in my house. If Jesus really knew who she was, he wouldn't be letting her touch him. Wow, the oil is in the box. It serves no purpose, but... Here's what I need you to know. That brokenness reveals what's already inside. Brokenness reveals what's already on the inside. And you need to know that the box is not as important as the oil. And we have the tendency to worry more about the box than we do about the oil. We worry about the box being comfortable. And just in case you don't know what the box is, it's your life. It's you. But there's something in you that needs to come out and be poured out. And it won't be poured out until it's broken. 
Oh. Pastor, you don't know my story. I don't need to know your story as long as you're broken. We're all a bunch of broken people in a place that's a holy ground. <laughs> and something beautiful can happen with broken people in a holy place. When they begin to pour out their oil upon Jesus. What's the oil? My praise. What's the oil? My worship. What's the oil? My hand praise. Every time I clap. Every time I shout. Every time I praise. My oil is being poured out. But I'm broken on the inside. I'm broken and I don't know what to do about my family. I don't know what to do about my finances. I don't know what I'm going to do about tomorrow. You might not know what you're going to do tomorrow. But I know what you can do today. And if you can praise them for a moment. And praise Pour out your oil today. Something can happen in this holy. I said something can happen in this holy place. In this holy ground. I'm broken. We'll talk about that for just a moment. And, and, and what's so interesting is that Simon. Simon's a character, man. Simon, the book of Mark tells us that Simon is known by Simon the leper. Simon the leper. Tell your neighbor, he was a leper. Okay. I didn't say leper like, uh, you know. Uh. He was a leper. Le leprosy. He had, he had a sickness, a disease called leprosy. Okay. Watch, watch for a moment, okay. He had a sickness called leprosy. If you had leprosy, you were a leper. Okay? He didn't run fast like a cheetah or anything like that. <laughs> Nothing to do with that. He had a disease in his body. And this leprosy is a disease that would cause your skin to fall. Your skin was rotting and your skin was dying while you were alive so basically it was like you were um like your body was being deceased while you're still alive it was decaying while he was alive everyone say that's nasty it is it's nasty because when you look at some of these uh diseases they would have worms coming out the worms are eating them His, 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 he'd be walking and let people with leprosy, they'd be walking, their ear falls off. You're like, oh, your ear just fell, bro. <laughs> matter of fact, matter of fact, leprosy was so contagious. The Bible says that there was an exclusive place for these people that when anybody got close, they had to be able to throw a rock distance and say, hey, I'm a leper, don't come close. Stay this far away from me. Simon the leper. And Jesus is in Simon the leper's house. Which means two things. Number one. In order for Jesus to be in Simon's house, it meant that Jesus had healed Simon. From a disease that represents sin. The theological explanation to spiritual application in leprosy is sin. Because sin is like leprosy. It separates us from God. Which then causes us to understand. Simon, you was a leper a few days ago. And now you're sitting here judging a woman who might not have the same sin as you, but just sin different than you. Simon was a leper. So, Pastor, what are you trying to tell him? Simon was considered unclean. Simon was considered isolated. 
because of the disease he had. But Jesus healed him, then goes to his house. Here's what I want to tell you. Number two, you ready for this? Don't forget where God found you. And don't forget where you were, where grace found you. I'm going to say it one more time. Don't you forget where you were when grace found you. Because somehow, in a matter of like 48 hours, Simon forgot I was in the same condition as this woman. And now you have the audacity to judge somebody because they're sinning different than you. Baby, you need to stop because the same grace that found you is the same grace that's going to find the next person sitting right next to you. You ought to clap your hands if you believe that there's hope for your brother. You ought to clap your hands like there's hope for your sister. You ought to clap your hands like there's enough grace for your marriage. And there marriage and their ch- oh my god you ought to clap your hands like you believe if god did it for me god will do it for you too don't you forget where god brought you out of man i see you all dressed real nice now and you got a little job now Pay taxes now. Oh, you got a little house now. You got a little, got a little car now. Oh, so you good now. Don't you forget. Can I, can I read something to you? Yeah. Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 12. Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 12. If, if, if they don't have it up there, you got it in your notes. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give to you great and splendid cities which you did not build. Watch this. You did not build. Watch this. You did not build and houses full of good things which you did not fill and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant and you eat and are satisfied. How many times did you say, did he say you did not? Four times. You've got to get it right. Everything you've got You didn't do it. It's the grace of God in you. Some of you should be statistics. Some of you, the the divorce that that went into your life. Some of you, the the things that happened at home while you were being raised. Some of you come from single mother, single father homes. But look at you. God has blessed you. You didn't do that. You didn't plant that. You didn't build that. It was the grace of God in you that allowed you to build what you got. Now, don't you, when God gives you everything you got, don't you be a Simon Bitter leper and say, what they doing for? him why is God doing that for him no 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 you've got to understand that everything we've got the Bible says every good gift comes from above you didn't build you didn't you didn't plant you didn't do it It says that you eat and then you're satisfied watch this I got a little ahead of myself watch it says that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt Out of the house of slavery. Simon, you forgot that there was a moment where you had a moment with Jesus too. But now this woman is having her moment. You judging that? No. Simon, there's room at the feet of Jesus for everybody too. So Jesus had to check him. Because Simon was such a coward. He was a coward. Can I show you why he was a coward? All right. The Bible says, the Bible says, Simon said to, help me, you got it in your notes. Simon said to, Simon said to, he didn't even have the courage to tell Jesus. He was like, mumbling, man, Jesus really knew who he was. What? What? 
Bro, you don't even have the, you're such a coward. You couldn't even tell Jesus in his face. But the Bible says, but Jesus answered him. Say, hey, Simon, I got something to tell you. What? <laughs> Read it. It's, it's just like that. He's like, I got something to tell you, Simon. Psh, say it. It says it like that. Say it. Say it, teacher. Go ahead, rabbi. There's two men. Both got forgiven. One had 50 denarii. One had five. They were both forgiven. Who loves more? The one who was obviously forgiven for more. Says, you've judged right. They love more because they've been forgiven more. Says, "Uh uh-huh. Simon, I came to your house. You offered me no water. You offered me no oil. And you didn't even give me a kiss. Which means that you invited me for the wrong reasons. You wanted the grand picture with me. God, I hit so, wow, I hit, I hit a nerve right now. Like I felt like, oh, God. You, you got into the space. You invited me into your space because you wanted to be seen with me because you think it makes you look good. See, the Bible says it like this. You love me with your lips. But your heart is far away from me. So everybody saw us together now. And you got the, you got the pose for the gram around the table. Everybody knows I came to your house. But this woman didn't care if anybody saw her. Because she wanted my heart. You wanted my hands, but she wanted my heart. I don't know who's here today. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just saying, could it be that you love him from your lips, but your heart is far from him? You come to this place because it's your good moral act to fulfill your week but this is a holy moment holy ground that is not to be taken lightly that when we come we're going to have an encounter with a loving father that's going to change our life forever One moment. Don't forget, Simon, what God has done for you when you have everything you need now. Don't forget how good has been he's been. The Bible says that She takes the oil and number three, when the jar was broken, the oil flowed. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. In the earthly realm, when something's broken, it no longer works. Do I got a witness? I remember we got real nice like this espresso machine. My heart was so filled with joy. I said, oh, I'm going to preach better every Sunday. Holy Ghost and espresso, that's a combination for like dynamite right there, right? And I'm Hispanic, dale, bro. <laughs> so it broke. 
can fix it, threw it away. Because that's what we do when something doesn't work, we throw it away. But in the kingdom of God, until it's broken, it doesn't work. You didn't hear me. If you've come, you say, I got nothing to offer God. No, I'm broken. My life is in shambles. My marriage is in shambles. My, my finance, I have nothing to give. I'm, I'm here to let you know that you're a perfect candidate for oil to flow. Because until it isn't broken, this is why it's hard for me to relate with people who have never gone through anything. Like, just successful people all the time, I just like, that's wonderful. I want to know all the stuff that broke you. Let me see your scars, bro. Can we even relate? Until it wasn't broken. It wasn't useful. I can never be used by God. I can never. No, you can. But the thing I've gone through, the, the moments that I've cried and yes. Until it's broken. It's not useful. Psalms 34, 18. I'm almost closing. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. The Lord is near to the, help me church, the Lord is near. And saves those that are crushed in spirit. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, the message Bible says like this, so we are not giving up. Oh, I feel like somebody has to... Somebody has to declare that, say, so we're not giving up. All right, if you have like family or a close friend next to you, I just want you to just kind of squeeze their hand a little bit and just say it again. Say it, one, two, three. So we're not giving up. Oh, we're not giving up. I feel, like, I feel like something's happening in the spirit right now when we're saying this right now. Can we do it one more time? Say one, two, three. So we're not giving up. We're not giving up. So we're not giving up. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though the outside often looks like things are falling apart on us. This is the Bible. On the inside... Where God is making new life. Not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Watch this. I love the message. It makes it so plain. These hard times are small potatoes. Compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebrations prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow. But the things that we cannot see now will last forever. Here's what God's trying to say. That the test and the trials of this present time cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us when he returns. I know you're broken and I know you've gone through some things this year already but can I tell you that not a moment goes by that the grace of God isn't carrying you to your next season. So I declare in the name of Jesus that every broken heart begins to lavish him with oil and with praise and with the goodness of your lips and with the praises of your heart I declare this house is a house that is filled with aroma of broken hearts that are lavishing him with praise if I got a church this morning you ought to stand up and give them praise
One moment. Watch this. It's not in the notes, but watch this. You know what I loved about this story? That everybody in that room experienced the fragrance of the oil. Everybody, I mean, if you're talking like a, a year's worth of like Isimiyaki, you know what I mean? Like, a year's worth of like whatever, you know, Le Labo stuff you use from Nordstrom's, whatever, you know. Like Le Labo, just look it up. It's good stuff. It's not cheap stuff. It's good stuff. And it breaks the entire room experiences it. Isn't that crazy? But what's more interesting is when everyone went home, there was only two that encountered the aroma. Everybody went home talking about what happened. It smelled so amazing in there. But only two went home saying, I still got the smell of the encounter. So I didn't just experience it. I encountered Jesus for myself. Listen, we're in a room filled with people. And you can leave today and say, that was a wonderful Sunday. They did a great job. They sang a new song. They did great. Amazing. Valerie was just like, ooh, anointed. But I wonder, is there anybody going back home saying, I encountered him. I still smell like him. I still got him on my skin. I still got him in my heart. I still, I'm so... This is a moment. This is a moment. This is a moment that can change your life forever. Jesus responded to the woman, said, Your sins are forgiven. You notice that that word didn't come to anybody else in that room, but the one that was willing to give it all? Your sins are forgiven. They still mean, oh, he thinks he can forgive sins. Oh, my God. I said, no, no, you need to stop. You need to stop because today's the day her life's about to change. Then he talks to her and he says, woman, today your sins are forgiven. Watch this. Go in Wait, 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 don't, wait, 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 don't clap, don't clap, don't clap. Go in. You know what she didn't have before? She had no peace in her heart. She was troubled. She was broken. She's a sinful woman with shame and guilt every day. But in one moment, everything changed. And she felt the peace of God come over her she could get up lift her head once again walk out of that room and say my life has forever been changed i feel no shame i feel no guilt there's no more sin again in me why behold the bible says everyone who is in christ jesus behold all things have passed away and everything is made new today is the moment that god wants to make everything new in your life can I challenge you one just a little bit deeper? That God never invites you to a safe life. Hear me, please. God never invites you to a safe life. He invites you to a faith life. Salvation is free, baby. Salvation is free. But the kingdom is going to cost you everything. Hear me by the Holy Ghost. I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. We got the blessing of the Lord, but we got the blessing of the Lord because it has costed us to surrender everything to God. She surrendered everything she had. 
This is all I got. And, she said, and he says, I saved you. But now I'm going to save you. You're going to go in peace. You're going to have joy. You're going to have blessing. You're going to have abundance. You're going to have everything you need because you were willing to surrender. God never calls you to a safe life. And I know, I know, we all want a safe life. Comfortable. I feel the Holy Ghost. But God is saying, is there anybody willing to seize this moment where your family can forever be changed? Where your marriage can forever be changed? Where your finances can forever be changed? Is there anybody willing to surrender everything they've got right here, right now? And say it's more than a good Sunday. I encountered God. And I smell like him now. Everywhere I go. I, I got him. If I get in my car. He's in my car. <laughs> oh God. I learned something. I learned that proximity comes with the price. Proximity comes with the price. Proximity comes with the price. But once you've encountered the reward of that proximity, it's priceless. You know what Jesus did? Jesus paid a high price to come close to you. Because when you couldn't get to him, he got to you. How do I get close to God? You don't understand. He's closer than you think. He's sitting at the table. He's so low. He's sitting so low that even in your low place, you can reach him. He's walking so slow that even in your sickness and your incapacity, you can reach him because he's waiting. He didn't, you didn't go to him. He came to you first. And that price was the price of Calvary where he shed his blood. And he said, I'm going to pay the price so that I can have proximity with you. And you and I can be together forever. This is the moment. Can you lift your hands to heaven for 30 seconds? Before I make this altar call right now, lift your hands and say, God, I am broken. I don't know how much I can give. I'm burnt out. I don't know if I have anything left in the tank. And God is saying to you, you are a perfect candidate to experience my grace today. So I declare in the name of Jesus that every broken heart and every crushed spirit will experience an encounter with the grace of God today. One moment in his presence is going to change everything for the rest of your life. So here it is. Here it is. I need you to look at me for a moment. Will you seize this moment right now? You're not here by coincidence. You're not here by mistake. God used someone to invite you. God used social media for you to get here. God used your neighbor to get here. God used your circumstance. God used your pain. God used your problem. God used everything to get you there right now. Well, you seize the moment. I'm declaring that when I count to three, every heart that is longing for an encounter with Jesus today. Every shame is gone. You're going to care more about what Jesus thinks than what anybody else thinks. Your ego, your pride, you're going to lay it down and you're going to come and you're going to say, God, this is my moment and I'm here and I'm going to pour out my oil before you. This is all I've got left, Jesus. This is all I've got. This is all my family's got. And this is all you're requiring. Here it is. If that's you today, at the count of three, don't hesitate. I need you to come up. First thing though, I need all the coaches to come up here first. 
every coach, every person coaching, I need you to come up. I want you to turn around. I need you to turn around. As people come, as people come, you're going to start laying hands. You're going to start praying for people. These people are going to be praying for you and declaring healing, deliverance, freedom over your life. At the count of three, if this is you, I need you to come up now. One, two, three. I want you to come up now. I want you to come up now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on.